Hello everyone, I'm CARE 11 meteorologist Laura Becker, an environmental advocate and of course a huge supporter of clean water and the work that Freshwater Society does. I'm honored here today to host Water Connects Us to support Freshwater's work and the critical role we can all play in protecting our water. For the next 15 to 20 minutes, you will hear what Freshwater is doing right now to protect water and what you can do to support the mission. On the screen is Freshwater's contact information to learn more and to make a contribution to support our work. We have a fast moving program here today with three speakers. John Linkstein has important updates with what you can do to support the important work Freshwater is doing and two special guests will also join us then I'll come back to share more ideas on how you can be involved. So without further ado, I'll introduce Freshwater's Executive Director, John Link Stein, who has a past deeply rooted in public service and government work, the Minnesota Department of Health, the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, and the DNR as well. All of that involving keeping our environment healthy and our communities healthy. John, hello, good to see you. Hi, Laura, thanks for, for joining me today. Absolutely. John, there's a lot going on in the world right now, a lot of it very heavy topics, and it almost seems like environmental issues have to or are naturally taking a little bit of a back seat. But where is fresh water fit in what's happening in the world currently? You know, the recent events in Minneapolis have really hit us hard too. Our, our programs, our staff, our work has been centered in the Twin Cities and we're a part of this community. We deeply feel the unnecessary and uh, horrible death of George Floyd at the hands of police uh, in our own work, in our own community life. So it's part of our response to that is to own our own role in addressing racism and the systems that underlie racism in our communities. One of those is our water systems. And so we need to step into the conversation. We need to learn from others that are not like us. And we need to engage in ways that are meaningful. Now, who are we? This is kind of the starting point. Freshwater's been around for 50 years. Largely, we're people like me, white folks, science-oriented folks who live in the suburbs. And we deeply need to hear the voices and the causes of others in addressing our water infrastructure. Do people have access to safe and fresh water resources in their communities? And how can we do a better job as communities rebuild of addressing their needs in an honest and better way for fresh water and for those community members that have not been at the table in previous decisions? That's amazing. So that's one side of what's going on. And then there's also COVID-19. How does that play a role? Yeah, the COVID-19 response has really been um, changing a lot of our work, but we are still going forward full, full speed with our work on public policy. A couple of areas, you know, traditionally the legislative session has been one area that we've engaged directly in working on public policy issues. This year's session got interrupted by the virus, as we all know, and so we had to adapt a lot of our work to being online, but our public policy work is exemplified by one project, the Dakota County Water Train proposal. You might remember that from last year, where a company wanted to drill wells and take water from the aquifer underground and put it in train cars and ship it to the Southwest United States for irrigation water and for other reasons. Now that woke up a lot of folks about, there is something that we need to address. We put a lot of time and effort into addressing that in the legislature, and I'm glad to say that the legislative uh, comments that we got back in response to our lobbying efforts and our advocacy was very, very well received. So that's a positive. Also, we've got one of our own staff members, Jen Cater, who's now been appointed by Governor Walz to the Clean Water Council as of the end of uh, March. So she's attending all of the Clean Water Council meetings in, per in person online like this. That's amazing. She's doing a great job and they're still focusing on how we're going to make use of those clean water funds, $100 million that comes from our tax dollars every year to support restoration and protection of fresh water. So that's important work that we're continuing to do. We also then have our 
our master water stewards, the folks that are trained in how to protect water in their own neighborhoods and, and communicate with their neighbors and engage. We still are educating. This year, we've got a group of 10 artists that are going to be uh, going through the water uh, stewardship training program, and they're going to do public expressions of art. Now, those might be murals. We've all grown familiar with the power of a mural right now at this important time in our history. It might be something around the storm drain in their neighborhood. It might be poetry, it might be music, or it might be some other form of art, but 10 artists in Hennepin County are becoming trained water stewards. So those are some really great examples of, of our work. And of course, our weather guide calendar. That, oh, yeah. that is still something we're ready to produce. You know, though, without the state fair, without all those things on a stick, and without the CARE 11 barn, we're not sure how we're going to make our uh, initial launch of sales for the yeah. uh, weather guide. But we're excited to do it, and we, and we know that we've got a loyal following of folks that love that calendar, and we're going to be uh, producing it again and ready to uh, sell it come August. Well, I think I might be able to help you out a little bit in getting the word out with the calendar. We I love it. That. I really do use it absolutely every single day for a lot of different reasons, both personally and professionally. It's a great piece of work. It is. And the photographs are incredible. So I just want to say thank you to all the people who uh, contribute important information. The, the beautiful photographs, we get almost 5,000 photographs submitted every year that we have to comb through. We love combing through them because we get to use about 500 of those 5,000 in our calendars. And I am always amazed by people's generosity. Here in Minnesota, of course, we're the land of 10,000 lakes. All this water around us. We have the Lake Superior and the Great Lakes. What is unique about our part of the world that does make water so important? You know, what's really wonderful about Minnesota is not it's 11,000 584 lakes, which is the actual number, not, there you go. not 10,000. It's Those are the ones that are greater than 10 acres and more than five feet average depth. So we're very proud of those of those lakes. But we're also a headwater state and, and everyone understands that everyone lives upstream and everyone lives downstream. Minnesota is kind of unique in, in some respects because we're at the head of three major continental watersheds. The Great Lakes is one that goes out to the St. Lawrence and then the Red River of the North that makes it into Lake Winnipeg and ultimately flows north into Hudson Bay. And then the giant watershed of our state, the Mississippi River, where most of our water goes. But 98, more than 98% of the water that leaves Minnesota fell here. Wow. So that, that means that the water that we send downstream is our water, not someone else's water. And so that creates this enormous sense of, I think, responsibility for us all to make sure that we're doing everything we can to protect and restore our own water. Very great. And when it comes to uh, our water here, what would you say is the number one thing that we kind of have to focus on here? Well, I think one of the things that's so critically important is to be good water stewards of whatever you own wherever you live, whether you live in the city or you live outside the city, whether you farm land or whether you rent an apartment, there are things you can take action on in your life that will protect and conserve and restore water. So many things, just being aware of the water in your home community where you live and work and being sensitive to what you can do to protect it. So things like how we, how we deal with our lawns, how we deal with yeah. Our, our vehicles and our, and our way of living, how much water we consume in our homes. Do we make the wisest use of, our, of water? So all of those things help us become good water stewards. And if everyone is a, became a great water steward, we would do a lot to protect and conserve and restore water quality in Minnesota. I heard recently the phrase that protecting the good is just as, if not more important than repairing and restoring the bad. Where do you stand on that? That is a really valid uh, point. For, first of all, about 60%, almost 60% of the water in Minnesota is, has some form of impairment, meaning it fails to meet a standard of water quality. And that 
that 60% impairment is something that probably much of it was here before we started measuring uh, because of the legacy of past actions. Uh, but 40%, the good news is 40% of our watersheds are not impaired. They are pristine, they are meeting water quality standards and protecting those is very important because the cost of restoring your health, as we know from our own bodies, the cost of restoring your health is always more than the cost of preventing it from deteriorating. So if we just did kind of good uh, practices on the land, that's the much more affordable way to protect our water quality. Uh, so it is important to protect the good and work hard to restore that is that is not good. I have I could go on and on with questions from then. <laughs> All of this is very inspiring that the little things that we all do at our, in our daily lives really do add up to a better Minnesota and a better world as all our, as you mentioned, all our water does flow uh, elsewhere. But uh, you do have some special guests that you'd like to introduce to us. Yes, thank you. And I am very pleased uh, today to welcome the commissioner of the Minnesota Department of Health, Jan Malcolm, who will give a brief description of why safe water is so critical to our health as Minnesotans, especially at this important time with the COVID-19 virus and just all the other ways that uh, fresh water impacts our health and connects us all to good health. Hi, I'm Jan Malcolm, Commissioner of the Minnesota Department of Health. You know, even in the time of COVID-19, we can still go to the kitchen sink and expect to get plenty of safe water. And that's going to be something very important for all of us to continue to do to help prevent the spread of COVID-19. In the developing world, hand washing with soap is a key strategy for preventing two of the top killers of children around the world, deaths from diarrheal diseases and pneumonia. While we don't see that here in the United States, don't be too quick to dismiss the value of hand washing, especially now. In normal times, Water for hand washing prevents the spread of diseases like salmonella, E. coli, norovirus, adenovirus, and hand foot disease. These kinds of germs get on our hands after we use the toilet, change a diaper, or handle raw meat. A single gram, that's about the weight of a paper clip of human feces, can contain one trillion germs. That's not a pleasant thought, but there you go. Our hands can also carry germs if people cough or sneeze on them or touch an object that has germs on it. If our hands have germs and we don't wash frequently, these germs can easily move from person to person and make, make people sick. This is one of the absolutely known, most likely routes of transmission for very many infectious agents. We touch our eyes, nose, and mouth frequently without even realizing it. Germs like COVID-19 can get into our bodies through our eyes, nose, and mouth. Hand washing removes these germs from our hands, and it's something, again, that each one of us can do to prevent the spread of COVID-19, to prevent ourselves from getting sick, and to prevent us from transmitting it to, to others, to our loved ones, our neighbors, uh, vulnerable people in our community. And there's also a powerful connection, obviously, between clean, safe water and our economy. From Roseau to Roseville, the economic engines in our communities rely on a dependable supply of clean water. Our water infrastructure is rapidly aging in Minnesota, and we know through a federal survey that $7.4 billion will be needed over the next 24 years just to maintain our current drinking water infrastructure. The state's Drinking Water Revolving Fund provides grants and low interest loans for the highest priority water and wastewater treatment infrastructure projects in our state. We have plenty of safe water today because those before us invested in protection, monitoring, and treatment. And now is our turn to invest for future generations. Quite literally, we don't have water, we don't have health. Plentiful, safe water doesn't just happen by accident. Engineers at the Minnesota Department of Health and sanitarians work with public water systems to make sure the water in our homes and businesses meet all the requirements of the Safe Drinking Water Act. The Minnesota Department of Health ensures that new wells are properly located and constructed to keep contaminants out. But if we don't have partnerships with our local communities and businesses, 
with nonprofits, with cities, with agricultural producers and other businesses to guard our lakes, rivers, and groundwater that serve as drinking water sources. If we don't have those partnerships with those folks that control the, the production of material that can threaten our water sources, we, we couldn't possibly protect the drinking water at the other end of that process. So we must have these partnerships, and it's a big job beyond what our state agency or city utilities can do on their own. It really do does take a community. It takes businesses. It takes nonprofits. It takes, takes local government. It takes agricultural producers. It takes willing landowners to use the land that drains to a well in ways that prevent contamination. We also know that not all Minnesotans have the same opportunity to enjoy safe drinking and recreational waters. As we study our current drinking water system, both public water supplies as well as the private wells that provide drinking water to a million Minnesotans, several inequities become clear. Our future work must include more equitable protection for those who drink from private wells, for those who drink from smaller public water supplies with limited resources, and also pay some of the most expensive water bills in the state. For those who have to pay to reduce and remove contaminants introduced by others. For those who consume contaminated fish and to ensure access to lakes and rivers for recreation for all. Safe drinking water is absolutely essential for healthy people, for healthy communities, and for a robust economy. Our vision is to ensure safe and sufficient drinking water for everyone, everywhere in Minnesota, now and into the future. A legacy of clean and safe water depends on the actions we take now. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Malcolm, for your thoughtful words about the importance of safe, reliable drinking water and water in our communities for our public health. We take it seriously at Freshwater and I'm so glad that you are serving our state as the head of the Minnesota Department of Health. The next person I'd like to introduce is Dr. Michael Osterholm. We all know him from his work uh, here in the state of Minnesota. He's been a, an expert in public health and infectious diseases his whole career. He was formerly the state epidemiologist at the Minnesota Department of Health, and now he works at the University of Minnesota's Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy, and he is a global expert when it comes to dealing with pandemics like the one we're in. Thank you so much, Mike Osterholm, for being on, the, on our, our fundraising virtual event today and for joining us. Tell me a little bit about why protecting and restoring and assuring safe and clean water is so important for our health. When we really look at the state of the world today, we understand all the challenges that we have from an environmental perspective, and even from just general governance and how what we do matters, not just for us, but for generations to come, there probably is no better indicator of what we are doing or not doing to protect that future than what is the current state of our fresh water. This state is so blessed to have the abundant water supply that it does. And yet every day we abuse that water in ways that uh, are going to have implications for our future about the safety of the water, what kind of chemicals we put into it, what kind of, of infectious agents enter into that water. And although it's often not appreciated that this is happening, it is something that is happening. And but for an organization like the Freshwater Society, we wouldn't be addressing the issues in anywhere the same way about the importance of that water. So someone who has spent 45 years here in Minnesota for trying to protect the public's health, I can say with absolute certainty, we've never had more challenges in some of those areas of protecting the public's health, particularly when it comes to the safety and the adequacy of our water supplies. So uh, when you think about uh, supporting the Freshwater Society, think about it not as an investment in you or today. Think about it as an investment in your kids and grandkids forever. And that's what we need today to, to accomplish uh, supporting the environment for the safety, security, and the long-term heritage of our children. Thanks, Mike. What do you do for fun around water? You know, without any question, the very best moments of my life have had some involvement with water. 
uh, as a young boy, I uh, loved to trout fish in the streams of Northeast Iowa where I was born and raised. I was a lifeguard at our local pool uh, in eighth grade and uh, <laughs> continued that through the duration of my high school. I swam on swim teams both in high school and college. Then after I graduated from college, I had the good fortune to marry into a family that had a beautiful lake place in northern Wisconsin, where I literally raised my kids on that water, uh, water that uh, was not just about uh, being wet, but it was about being involved. It was really a, a, a wonderful gift and a gift that my kids and I still share even all these years later, and now I'm uh, doing it all over again with my grandkids. And then as some know, I have had this... Uh, you might say, a crazy urge to swim the English Channel. And so I have spent many, many hundreds of hours in my life swimming the lakes of Wisconsin and Minnesota and training for the English Channel work. There were days that I would do 12-hour swims of 30 or more miles and just find myself lost in the beauty of the water. And then later in my life, I had the good fortune of buying a property in Northeast Iowa the only property that had three trout streams on it, uh, actually uh, uh, in the four state area. And I did a great deal of work to restore those trout streams as well as the land area back to tall grass prairie and the hillsides to oak savannas. And some of the most cherished moments of my life have been spent at what is now known as Prairie Song Farm. And again, now that I have my grandkids, my kids now have their own lake place in uh, Northern Wisconsin. And uh, uh, I find uh, doing all over again what I once did with my children, with my grandkids. And it's all about being wet with the water with them. So to me, water has always been an important part of my life, personally. Professionally, it has been absolutely a very critical part of my life because anytime you deal with infectious diseases, the transmission of those diseases via water uh, is always a very important consideration. Uh, and so from that perspective, I uh, also have a, a very healthy respect for both the, the incredible benefits of water, the, the health requirements of, of a safe water supply. And I've also seen what can happen when you don't have that safe water supply. And so to me, uh, water is almost in my life like the air that I breathe. Uh, and uh, from that reason, I cherish it, I respect it, and I appreciate it. And I appreciate all that the Freshwater Society does to help support that part of my life. Thank you, Dr. Osterholm, for your thoughtful words and for your support. I so appreciate you joining us today. Now I'd like to hand it back over to Laura. Thank you, John, Mike, and Jan, for sharing your perspective, your wisdom, and your inspiration with us here today. Water does really connect us and plays such an important role in our world and in our own health, our daily lives. Please join me in making a gift to fresh water. Every drop counts in supporting the important work that fresh water does to provide access to safe, reliable water for absolutely everyone. Thank you, fresh water. You and I make fresh water possible. I hope I can count on your support today. Follow the directions on your screen to join me as a volunteer, an advocate, and a donor to fresh water.